when we talk about mental health, it's not specific to the hospitality industry. It's, it's a part of our society and our culture, and it's something that we really need to get better at talking about. And by talking about it, we eventually get to a place where we can confront the uncomfortable. I'm Danny Vallant, and this is Dirty Linen, the podcast that takes the issues the hospitality industry finds hard to air in public and shakes them all about. Sydney chef Jared Ingersoll has been one of the best known food personalities in Australia for decades. He's cooked in London at Michelin Star The Square. He's really well known for Dank Street Depot in Sydney, one of the first restaurants that really brought farmers to the centre of the table and, and the food conversation. Jared's not working in restaurants at the moment. He's uh, got a very interesting job, which we'll definitely hear more about. But I'm chatting to him today during Mental Health Week because Anthony Huckstep told me I needed to, and I always do what Huck says. He said, when you're talking about mental health, wellness, hospitality, Jared's someone that you've got to have as part of the conversation. So Jared, Huck dobbed you in, but I am so happy to have you here on Dirty Linen. Yeah, look, yeah thanks for that. And thanks, Huck. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, look, it's, um, yeah, I've got a bit of a soft spot for old Huck's, but we, um, we spend a lot of time, um, because we're both sort of so invested in the industry um even though like you said i'm not i'm not on the pans anymore um it's yeah the, just you know subjects around the hospitality industry i'm very much i'm in all the way it's a it's a it's a lovely beast that i like to sort of that i'm very happy to be a part of yeah well we're lucky to have you so tell us what you're doing now and then let's track back uh, so at present um so i got a role working for a tech company called Canva. Um, and this was just before the COVID thing hit. And what it was, like, it's, it's, it's a pretty groovy gig, to be honest. Um, it's, a, it's a great company. But the role that I've taken is pre-COVID, it was like looking after their events globally. Um, obviously, COVID sort of put the handbrake on that guy. Um, but also, it's given me the vehicle to really um, leverage all the work I've done around sustainability and how we um, operate as communities and organizations and how to lighten our footprint so i'm doing a lot of work at the moment um, developing a sustainability strategy that will see um, the organization going to um, carbon neutral and and where it's really fun is because we've at Canberra they've got a really big food and beverage program so we've got our kitchens here and the, they've got a team of chefs and they feed between six seven hundred people um, you know five times a week for breakfast and lunch so we're really able to leverage that connectivity with um, food and farms and and uh, put a lot of support into regenerative agriculture. Um, we're doing a lot of work on, uh, at the moment, like how we can sort of really um, learn from traditional knowledge and some of the beautiful work that's going on um, in agriculture in that space. And because we're an organisation that has got a... Um, a fairly big food and beverage expenditure. Um, it's it's really interesting being able to really leverage that to to have some really impactful goods and to make sure that we're supporting farmers that are doing the right things, um, and to also celebrate that journey of food and yeah you know, and and to it, it, you know I'm I'm really enjoying it because for me food is everything and we can solve all of life's problems with a plate of food and. And what I mean by that, like, you know, where you buy your food is not going to, you know, reduce your carbon footprint, but it's a great place to sit down and have a meal and then illustrate aspects of sustainability. You know, um, it's not going to fix everything. It's not the magic bullet, but it's a great place to affect change and to have a great conversation and to create awareness. Yeah, well, I, I think it's great. I mean, what you're doing sounds great and it sounds like a really fun job and, you know, how nice to have a job that's not in restaurants but still very much engaged with food right now. Um, I think it's also great to hear about that because it demonstrates a pathway that's not the traditional, uh, you know, cook rising up through the ranks, owning a restaurant and then what? More restaurants, another restaurant. Um, you've you've done so many different things through your career, and it's really fantastic to see that being a chef can take you to so many different places uh, to engage with issues of broader importance. As you say, like you can, I think you can solve a lot of the problems of the world simply 
through what you eat and not just what one person eats but that's just part of a broader change and I guess you did that in your um in your restaurants but uh now you're just doing it in a different arena yeah and and it's kind of fun and and like when I stepped away from restaurants it was a very um conscious uncoupling (laughs) yeah is the right way to way to put it but it it for me you know because it has um this bit has relevance to the the conversation around um, mental health and and you know so I was running three restaurants um, at one stage I was you know of those three restaurants um, two of them were failing horribly um, I had a relationship that was failing horribly um, multiple relationships were being stressed um, and when the I went through the process of just scaling back all the operations like it wasn't like I just flicked the light switch off and ran away like it was it was a massively long drawn out process and a lot of really deep thinking and strategy around it but I remember this one stage just sort of sitting there and and everything about me to my core was that I was a chef there was no other version of me other than I'm a chef that's and and so just the simple process of actually trying to figure out how the fuck do I think about myself without like what is a chef without a kitchen what am I doing like, you know, what is my next step? And um, I was really fortunate to have a couple of really smart friends that sort of helped me pull apart my skills and my capacity to help me start to frame different opportunities that they can present. Because I think that sometimes you can get really stuck, especially when you're dealing with, you know, stressful kitchens all the time, just like, what next? Like, yeah, and and... Also, the the sense of failure when your businesses fail, like when you're that, when you're when when you're that attached to it, where it is a, it's like a limb. To have that not there, like how do you separate the failure of a business from a failure of, of you as a person? Like, and it, that's a really uncomfortable thing. It's tough. It's it sounds really tough, and I guess when your identity is so bound up with that, I suppose you you can lean back into it, you can bury yourself in it further and say, well, this is who I am and I just need to make this version of myself work or you can do what you did, which is possibly more challenging and more of a lengthy process, which is to work out how you can redefine yourself. So is it, um, I mean, you talked about people helping you through that process is is that something that you've always been able to do like to to look outside yourself for advice no nah, i really suck at it <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't come naturally and it, it, more so now because it's something that i've practiced okay um but i i forced it upon myself and there was a, a period in my life where like I'd lost both of my parents, really close friend of mine um, had uh, taken his own life and, you know, like I mentioned that, you know, I was going through the um, through a divorce as well and and so there was, a, it was, um, I just realised that if I didn't do, like I just, I, I just, I needed help. So I was able to sort of um, sort my shit out and and I chatted to a mate and, and she said, look, you know, go talk to this person, they helped me out a lot. Um, and then, and I'd been to counselling before, um, you know, I'd been to relationship counselling um, as part of, you know, the relationship that I was in at the time. And so the idea of going to a counsellor wasn't a concept that was foreign to me. And I do realise that there's something that's nice in it, but it it's not an easy thing. Like you, the first, you know, like it's, it's awkward because I, was, I wasn't brought up to be forthcoming with my emotions or my feelings. What was the model that you were brought up in? What did you, what's, what sort of mode of being did you carry with you? Um, oh, so I was brought up with a, um, it was just mum bringing up a bunch of kids. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, um, so we brought up in, in um, housing commission back in New Zealand. Um, and it was just sort of, I didn't really have a, you know, growing up through school, I was like probably about three and a half times taller than everybody and probably as thick as a piece of paper. So I was the one that everybody picked on. And um, and so I had a few close friends, but we were sort of, 
you know, it was just, I didn't, I didn't really have any strong male role models. Um, and, you know, when it came to people that I started to really sort of um, look up to, it was when, you know, I started sort of smoking pot and skipping school. And, and so I sort of, you know, my role models in the earlier sort of more influential stages of my life were not necessarily the most um, helpful ones for a, for a young man. And so then, you know, it wasn't all doom and gloom. I've, I've had a really good life and I've got like, really good friends and had a good career. But, like, in those that, that framework that was set up for me, but there wasn't anywhere to go to talk about emotions. Like, they were just stuff that you either carried or they spilled over or you dealt with them in unhelpful ways. What were some of those ways that they spilled over or manifested in unhelpful ways? Um, oh, you know, just the, the usual sort of, you know, uh, severing ties with um, with friends and or you know maybe sort of you know just typical sort of stuff that uh, like a young teenage boy in New Zealand was, would sort of get up to but at the same time I also had this thing where I liked going out for bushwalks and, and go hiking and camping so even though I'd probably sort of would party um, a little bit too hard in some part times of my life. I also had this other space that I could go to, that and and that connectivity to the land and the environment has been something that I've drawn on unconsciously in the first stages of my life. But now that I've in the later stages of my life, I realise how much how what the importance of that space is and, and what it does for me. So now I that's a really powerful tool for. For um, you know, I can't spend too much time in the city without going mental. Like I have to get out into the bush, or I have to go into the. We're going to the snow this weekend. Like it's fun, but it's also that connectivity to land and nature, is has been really nurturing throughout my career. And it's the thing that has also given me the most inspiration um, through my cooking career. It's the reason why I focus so heavily on provenance. Um, it's you know, as as a cook, I wanted to tell the story of the land. Um, and I did that at a time. My thinking was like that at the time of like Marco Pierre and White Heat, where it was all like rock stars, drug abuse, and you know torturing dishes into <laughs> some sort of unnatural form. <laughs> and so it was. It was that um, for me that. Yeah, and that's where um, Dang Street Depot really, I think, sort of struck a chord with a lot of people because I kind of gave no fucks to what the reviews were. In fact, when we, when we in our first year, we were. Um, voted um, best cafe in Sydney, and it was the first time there was a category like that in the Good Food Awards. And um, I slept through the award night just because I was rooted. <laughs> <laughs> I um, yeah, there was sort of it was um, yeah, it was, it was fun. That's so rock star. Marco would have approved. Um, it's really it's really interesting what you say about nature and how you, even without knowing that you needed it, you sought that out. I think that's something that people could really pick up on, you know, perhaps if someone feels really buried in what they're doing and notices that, you know, they're not making decisions that are always helpful, there might be something that's sort of got that that glimmer and that crack of a new a new way of doing things. It might be it might be music or it might be it might be a hobby, I don't know, but I think definitely getting out in nature and breathing the fresh air and just having that different headspace, that that broader horizon. I think is is so helpful and as you say it can really lead you down different pathways of creativity and discovery as well as personal development oh 100 percent I you know and and the thing is it's different for different strokes and for different folks and I, I've got different things that I I love doing like the idea of sitting on a hill surrounded by nothing apart from silence and dirt and and the sounds of nature and all that sort of stuff is is so glorious but there are certain times when there is nothing that enriches me like two hours of air bleeding sepultura or some death metal. Like, you know, this is, <laughs> it's like, you know, not everything is sold by just, you know, there's not one fix for everything. So it's, yeah, whatever, whatever works for you, embrace it. As long as there's a positive aspect to it. Did there come a point for you where you thought, uh, I'm not really doing okay here and it is time to try something different? Yeah. And, um, and that's when I first really focused on counselling and um, and invested a lot of time in in sort of trying to be aware of what of how I ticked. Um, and it, it took a while. So I mean, and what I mean by that is that sometimes um, sometimes you know you you may like I may get actually yesterday I was sort of 
you know, my partner came home and I was just a little bit, probably a little bit distracted, a little bit short, and I realised that it was, I had a really tight chest and I was just feeling anxious about shit. And, and I sort of, um, I was trying to sort of get my head around, like, what, you know, what, you know, what's going on? Like, I'm, I know, we're, you know, this, like everybody at the moment, the world is weird and everybody's facing lots of different stresses. And, and so you know, I went through the little checklist in my head about like, what it could be and, um, you know, is it because of, is it financial stresses and, you know, I know what that looks like and, you know, the kids were mucking around and it was causing me a little stress. So, I, you know, I was a bit tired from the night before and, and then I sort of realised that, like, I just, you know, I turned around and said, look, yeah, I just need a bit of a cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. You know, and there's that thing of, like, you know, and she was like, yeah, okay, it's, yeah, 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 like, it's fine, I've gone. And, and, and so that process of going through the checklist in your head as opposed to um, – just sitting in with that tight chest or that feeling of impending doom that can sometimes be faceless. So there was a time in my life where that would just hover above me and I couldn't, it was crippling because I couldn't make the next step because the, the anxiety and that, it didn't have, it didn't have a name or a face or a reason. And through you know, practice and talking and reaching out and having uncomfortable conversations with um, people that I trust, I've been able to sort of work out a list in my head, like a checklist. So, you know, I default to that, go, okay, what what could be causing this anxiety or this, or this feeling? And sometimes you get to the bottom of the list and you go, look, maybe I'm just having a shit day and I need a cuddle. And, um, and, 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 and and you get that, and it's sort of like, okay, it's still there, but at least I know that you know, it's not it's not all bad. Jared, making a list like that and going through it and maybe coming to the end of it and realising that you need a hug, all of that requires uh, a bit of vulnerability and a bit of, you know, it's, it's not that push-on mentality. It's about that sort of stopping, taking stock, opening up, questioning, what is it that helps you get to that place where you, where you are able to open up like that? Um, so for, for me it's been a, a bit of a journey of sort of discovery and dealing with some pretty awful times um, that has given me the sort of ability to be able to go, okay, this is what I need to do. So we're talking about uh, mental health and we're talking about the specifics of mental health in the hospitality industry. And and I, it is a real issue in our industry um, and I think that our industry allows for certain mindsets to exist um, and, and can support certain sort of mental behaviours, uh, for loss of a better word. So... Even though it's an issue for our industry, I don't think it's the fault of the industry. It's just that our industry allows for um, certain things to happen, such as instead of dealing with issues, you just deal with Friday night service. You can shroud yourself in the blanket of a really busy, stressful restaurant because you don't have to confront stuff. Um, you can. Our industry is all about um, putting up a face. Like you do not do service without putting up a face. You do not deal with a difficult customer without putting up a face. Whatever's going on in your head, that's not what you present to the customer because otherwise you probably wouldn't have a business. Um, but I also think that when we talk about mental health, it's not specific to um, to the hospitality industry. It's, it's a part of our society and our culture and it's something that we, we really need to get better at talking about. And by talking about it, we eventually get to a place where we can confront the uncomfortable. Um, one of the things that I've observed in my life is that I don't think mental health is an issue that's specific to the hospitality industry, but it is definitely something that's skewed by men. So I've, I know seven, there are seven men that I've lost in my life um, because they've taken their own lives. And the first time I experienced that, I was 11 and it was a, a cousin that was 15. Um, out of that, um, out of those seven men, four were in the hospitality industry and three of them weren't. So you can't say it's specific to the hospitality industry, but it seems to be a pretty massively skewed male thing. And there have been a couple of times in my life where, I've, um, where there has been an opportunity for me to, and I say opportunity and it's really the wrong word because it was actually 
So where I was in communication with two people when they were going through the crisis and in one of those instances I wasn't able to help because the guy was in North America and I was able to, unable to track him down. And, but there was another time when I was able to, to be there. And so having felt what it was like to experience these different moments where mental health took control to the point of um, disaster, it made me realise that we need to get much better at being men and we need to really know what it is that, like, you know, this whole sort of vision of a manly man is such a pile of wank and bullshit and it gets me really cranky and I think that when there's this pattern of teaching our young men and our boys of what it needs what it means to be a man and part of that is you don't cry you bottle things up you push on take a cup of cement and and all that sort of wank it's it's so gross and wrong and and it's also selling a lot of the beautiful aspects of masculinity short. And so the looping back to the question about how I got to the place of that checklist, so for me it was sort of seeing what happens when things are left unchecked. And so when it comes to people talking about their emotions, it could be that you're having a bad day or it could be one step away from, you know, Disaster, you know, the tragedy of of losing a losing a life, and and so for me the the checklist is there because I know what it looks like. Um, I know what it looks like in me, and I also know what it looks like for others. And so that empathy and and that discipline of going fuck this is mental. Let's really focus on the issues. Is um, that's given me my internal checklist that I go through, and it's not because I'm worried about you know, doing anything myself. It's just because, okay, there's something going on. I need to really, this is important. This shit's for real. Like it's not, sometimes I'm just having a bad day and then it's move on. But other times it's like, nah, there's, there's something here. And I need, I need to, I need to have a look at that. And one of the things that I've discovered in that process of looking at it and reaching out to people, my network of friends, the, the, the con- connectivity I've got with a, people is just so glorious and real and beautiful and there's something gorgeous about sort of being able to pick up the phone to another mate and go you know how are you and listening to them and and letting them be vulnerable and and also allowing that vulnerability to happen like that's it's hard at first and the only reason it's hard is because we're taught that it should be hard and through practice you break that and then you expose yourself to something really quite splendid and kind of n- not that big a deal. <laughs> yeah, wow, Jared. I mean, one thing that really strikes me is the responsibility that you feel to be there for your friends and also the fact that you feel that you do have power to make change in somebody else's life by being there at the right time or by asking the right questions maybe? I mean, what is it that you think makes a good friend and a helpful friend when someone's feeling bad? Um, I think you just need to be, uh, the key thing is just be open and display empathy. And the and it's sometimes it's not even about, you don't even necessarily need to be a friend. Like when, I, when, when you go to a counsellor, you don't have, one of the reasons why that works is because you don't have that emotional connection to them and they can look at you like a problem. And you can converse about things in a very sort of unemotive, pragmatic way. And that can be really helpful. Um, Sometimes support can come from just a a level of awareness and and, and sort of allowing yourself to be empathetic to what the other person could be going through. And um, and the reality is sometimes you might listen to people and just go, fuck, they were just whinging, harden the fuck up. (laughs) Um, Which is sort of counterproductive for what I'm saying, but... um, one of the things I always try to do is just to apply um, because perspective is everything. So if this thing that I'm dealing with is the hardest thing that I've dealt with, then that hardship needs to be valued through that perspective. Um, if I'm talking to someone and what they're dealing with to me might be quite trivial and a bit sort of you know, 
like, if I apply my perspective to their issues, then I'm going to miss what it is that they're going through. Then I'm going to lose the empathy. So when people are sort of talking about these sort of quite sensitive things, um, I always try to put myself into into their shoes, not mine. Um, I apply my experiences and my knowledge, but I try to use their emotional state to sort of try to figure out how they're feeling. And so that sort of transference of, I don't know what the word is, like I'm not fucking diagnosed in any of I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not an expert in here. This is just my life experiences. I don't know the right words to use, but um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it really does. I think it's that difference or that it's that fine balance between being able to offer an outside perspective, which can often be so valuable to someone to be, you know, to give them a, a, an option of looking at things in a different way, which might really flip it and make it better. But then at the same time, having that empathy where you can try to stand in someone's shoes and not diminish the way they're feeling, because as you say, if that's important to them, then it needs to be you know, it needs to be held and valued and given its proper weight. Um, I think <clears throat> it's a really tricky one with um, with suicide. You know, people that are left behind often do feel so responsible and I can hear when you talk about the friend that was in the US that you weren't able to help, that, you know, the people that are left behind feel so just, I mean, you just never get over that feeling of was there something you could do. But I think it's important to say to people that sometimes there isn't anything you can do. Like you can't always be that fixer. Yeah. And and that's a hard reality because especially if you're used to fixing things, that sort of level of helplessness and, and understanding that you need to let go of that because there really was nothing that could have been done um that that sucks <laughs> um and especially like you know if you think like your average like you know blokey chef that's used to feeding about you know, fucking you know, 800 covers and you're doing three sittings on a friday and you're smashing it out in your short stuff problem you are a problem solving ninja that's what that's your jam like nothing can come at you in that kitchen where you're not able to go well just flip that change that garnish give that guy a call, see if he can come in. You know, you just sort of, you're, you're so, you're tweaked to this level of, you know, you're floating off the ground and you're solving all these problems and then all of a sudden something comes along that is outside of your sphere of influence and and sort of realising that you're just a human and, and these issues that are bigger than, than what you can deal with is, can, that can be a little bit crippling too because it's like, man, Especially in that traditional sense of that blokey bloke, you know, fuck it, mate, just push on and it's like, nah, don't. <laughs> yeah, well, that's vulnerability too, isn't it? Being able to notice that there are things you can't fix or can't fix in the moment. Uh, how do you balance that? Like if someone who does find comfort in that busy service and that restaurant routine, what are some ways of living that and being in it and you know being an awesome uh hospitality player but finding space within that or unwinding in a way that is uh helpful rather than damaging for for me for the one thing that i think is um is really important is that we are in this industry because of those moments of that give us the greatest amount of joy and pleasure um you know it's the whole sort of cliche adrenaline junkie chef sort of charging on like that is that's real and it, it exists there because it gets you out of bed and it pushes you and it drives you and it's it's freaking delicious and I get it um the same as like you know being front of house and dealing with a, a dining room full of punters and having table 26 hard work and short staff but being able to maintain that wonderful joyous at level of hospitality amongst chaos like it's so the, those things need to be celebrated and they're real and i think they're beautiful parts of our industry and that's what keeps us going but the thing that i will apply is like you know everything in moderation especially moderation so don't let that be your everything like you need to you need to switch off from it um you know we we, we often talk about drugs and alcohol having a, a being really detrimental in the industry I'm not going to say to anybody, don't drink, don't take drugs. If that's what you do, like you need that little tap out every now and then, but it's got to be moderated um, because that can make the environment really murky. 
And if you're doing massive hours, there's nothing more important than a good bit of exercise. And um, you may not go to the gym every single day. I'm not, you know, if that's not your thing, but prioritize some of that, um, some of that putting back into yourself. Um, because if you're, if, it's really easy for um, the busyness of the industry to create this conduit where everything is just being pulled from you. So it's really important to nourish yourself. And, you know, I think is for me, there's some really important things such as, you know, if you're going to go out and catch up with mates, do it around the Spend time to create moments of human connection with other people. Um, drink the delicious wines. Eat beautiful foods. Um, yeah, just make sure you put back in. Um, and... You know, some people go hardcore health, and I'm definitely, definitely not one of those people. But I do actually say that for me, what works is a bit of nature, um, connecting with friends. It's not about having 3,000 Facebook connections. It's about having a couple that you just sort of check in with every now and then. Um, focusing on the, the, the quality, not the quantity. Um, and that, that can be a little bit tricky because everything else we, you know, we want the likes, we want the connections, you want the accolades, you want the bank account. Everything else is measured in mass. And I think that when it comes to human connectivity, that that measurement should be in quality. Like, and if you don't have that human connection that you need out there, then there's nothing more important than the resources like Are You OK, Beyond Blue, like reaching out to these organisations to sort of um, to, to seek that human connectivity, um, like joining a club. Uh, you know, there's, there's different ways of doing it. Like, you know, because I think that um, – so in the industry that I'm sort of working in now, which is the tech industry, we see a lot of people working remotely and there's um, a lot of people that we travel from overseas for positions – and sometimes you find yourself in a social environment without any social connections because you're just new to town. You don't know anyone, like, you know, your, your family and people are sort of remote and removed. So I think in those, if you find yourself in those environments, it's really quite um, important to, to seek out a bit of humanity and to do things that might be a little bit outside your comfort zone, like maybe join a martial arts club or, I don't know, hang out in the arcade and play pinball if that's your jam. Um, yeah, just just look for, just look for a little bit of humanity. Oh my god, that's my age. I just said arcade and pinball. <laughs> I love it. It makes me want to go play Galaxian in a milk bar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. I think, you know, at this time uh, with the pandemic uh, flowering around us, uh, it is hard for a lot of people to maintain connections, at least in, this, in the way that they're used to. And I think, you know, we do turn so much to technology. Um, there's this all, a bit of a bit more nesting going on and people who, especially people that work in hospitality and who are used to being busy or busier, it's a bit different. So do you have any... Um, wise words for people who are struggling with the particular conditions we're in at the moment? Um, yeah, it's this is a really tricky one because it's one of those situations where like with what you guys are facing in Victoria, you've just had you know this shutdown happen again, so you've got this imposed sort of uh, separation from your normal life. Um, and, you know, us in Sydney, we're looking at, um, you know, there's talk about um, something, yeah, we could go into lockdowns in, in Sydney or what that looks like. And then you're also looking at things where you've got some people that are ignoring and just carrying on as if life is normal. You've got queues outside pubs and then you've got other restaurateurs that are struggling to maintain the social distancing. And, and so there's all this, we've got this weird environment where we're not just dealing with a stressful environment, we're dealing with an imposed sort of management of our human interactions and where it was kind of like, you know, we're talking about being connected and hanging out with mates, but at the same time, if you're in a lockdown situation, that doesn't exist. And and so it's, um, the, I'm very fortunate with the industry that I'm in at the moment that we have continued in a slightly different way. Um, so 
but there have been times in my life where I wasn't able to work and I was um, in quite vulnerable financial situations. And there's a couple of times where it's like I, I, I was I was leading a self-imposed isolation just because of what I was dealing with. And, and in those moments, um, you kind of need to just be patient. And it's really hard to say that. It's easy to say that and hard to practice, but it's just sometimes you just have to take a breath and then just wait for something to shift. Um, when you're in a situation where there's nothing that you can affect, um, you can't see a way out or what to do or the, you, there's no one there that you can pick up the phone to or you can't leave the house because you're in lockdown. Or, like, it's really important to just take a breath and and um, and one of the things, it sounds really trivial but it's really helpful, is just what we need to do is wait for the next breath. And then have another breath and then rack up 10 of them. Um, then concentrate on your breathing for another 15, 20. And then half an hour has gone by and you've just taken 100 breaths. And, you know, just, just allowing space for things to shift and allow for something positive to happen is, is sometimes really kind of important. And it sounds... Small, but if you're in a situation where you're feeling completely constricted and trapped, then just waiting and 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 just being patient and letting your head just sort of do whatever your head's doing is is, is a good little thing. I think that's so useful. And I was breathing as you were talking about breathing, and yeah, there does seem like there's a little bit more space in my brain after doing that. And I think, yeah, it's it's great. Sometimes it can be such simple things that help us shift. Um, Jared, it's been really such a privilege to talk to you and thank you so much for being as open as you have been. Um, it's, I know it's going to help people. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. If anyone does need someone to talk to right now, uh, you, there are people that are waiting to chat to you. So have a look at beyondblue.org.au. Also look at Hospo for Life and listen to Liam Crawley's chat on this podcast if you haven't already where he talks more about that. Um, you can also talk to Lifeline on 131114. Jared. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute privilege to have you on Dirty Linen. Oh, look, look it's my pleasure. And, and, and the, I just sort of also add to that list of people to talk to and resourcing because one of the things that we are uh, practised in, we know what it feels like to have awkward conversations. So what I want everybody that may not be desperately needing to find that support or that, or that help right now, just chat anyway. Like, talk about your emotions. Pick up your phone to your – if you're feeling great, pick up your phone to your mate and go, hey, I'm feeling good. How about you? Like, you know, get used to – the more the more often we talk about this stuff, we're going to remove the sensitivities to it. And then when there are no sensitivities, then we're having conversations. And then we can shift things when you're having a conversation. Love it. I'm glad – I'm glad, Huck – I'm glad Huck dobbed you in. It's been really great. <laughs> yeah, no worries. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production. Um, ah, someone's yeah. about to come to my door and my dog's going to bark. Sorry. It's okay. Dogs are good. <laughs> Get him. Get him. I'm so sorry. Just, Rob, here's a bit of an editing job for you. Hang on a sec. I've got to deal with this.